We begin this afternoon with Dr. Joseph Salerno on the topic of calculation and socialism. Okay, I want to start the lecture by uh, noting an article that I think is the most important article uh, uh, written in economic theory in the 20th century, and that is Economic Calculation in a Socialist Commonwealth, which was read by Mises at a conference in 1919 in German and then written up uh, as an article in 1920. Uh, the article and, uh, was then elaborated uh, and much more added to it into a full book, Socialism, which appeared, as uh, Professor Hulsman pointed out, the first evening in 1922. Uh, we have the, the translation of the article, which was translated in 1935 into English, um, economic calculation in the socialist commonwealth. Okay, um, I would like to point out that, the fa- that there is a, a very remarkable epilogue to this work, written by a contemporary, um, prominent contemporary Austrian. It, it really sums up Mises' argument and, 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 and demonstrates that a socialist economy, in the strict sense of the word, is impossible. Okay, so um, if you uh, take a read the read the article and then the the. Um, the epilogue by Salerno, so it's very, very important. <laughs> okay, um, what did Mises actually say? I mean, what, what was the gist of this article? Basically, w- l- let, me, let me just set the background a little bit um, and just in, in, in broad brush strokes give you what, what I think he accomplished in the article and, and then talk a little bit about the intellectual background that spawned the article. Uh, first of all, I think it, it completely destroyed the foundations in one fell swoop, okay, one mighty swing of the uh, samurai sword, so to speak. Um, it destroyed the intellectual foundations for the uh, case of the case for socialist economic planning, central planning. Okay, um, not just socialist, but any kind of central planning, whether it be. Um, the, the social democratic planning or um, national socialist or Nazi fascist planning or the New Deal planning of, of, um, World War II, uh, of the Depression period and World War II. Um, any sort of central planning um, is, is, is dashed upon the rocks of, of, of what we call economic calculation, the fact that it can't calculate, as we'll see. Uh, Secondly, this really represented a revolutionary breakthrough, I think, in economic theory, in positive economic theory, okay, because it demonstrated the nature and necessity of the price system in allocating resources. Classical economists had a good idea of why you needed a price system, but Mises um, had a deeper insight into the necessity of the price system. In fact, you could not do without one, okay. Um, The classical position was as summed up by John Stuart Mill, that you need the price system more or less to allocate resources to their most valuable uses, but that in distribution, when you talked about who got what, the government could step in and and redistribute income. Okay, Beza says, no, the price system is unified. It's integral, okay? Uh, prices are determined not only for, for consumer goods, but for, for, for resources, including labor. So uh, the, the pricing process distributes resources and income, and Mises used the term uno acto, in one act, okay, all together. Okay. And finally, it presented a, a, a theory, a new theory, which is the theory of monetary calculation. Okay. And um, that was really completed Menger's revolution, because Menger had talked about um, economic activities emanating from the uh, subjective interaction of subjective values of, of buyers and sellers, Mises showed how subjective values were translated through monetary calculation into cardinal prices, okay, into actual objective prices that entrepreneurs could use to calculate. Okay. All right, what about the background? Okay, before Mises wrote this article, um, you had a number of different schools of socialism of socialists. Uh, one school was known as the Utopian Socialists. I have them here. Yes. Beginning, I guess, in the 1820s or so, you had um, three, three of the more famous ones, Charles Fourier, Henri Saint-Simon, and uh, I think he's Scottish, uh, Robert Owen. 
Okay, and each one of these socialists had their own view and vision, which they elaborated in loving detail of what the future socialist society would look like. Uh, and that's why they were utopian socialists. They, they that so named by Mark, uh, Karl Marx, as we'll see. And uh, they wrote books and, and, and detailed what the future socialist paradise would look like. Uh, Charles Fourier claimed that socialism would be so great that the oceans would turn into lemonade. Uh, you, you would be able to ride lions. Lions would present themselves to you to be ridden. Uh, and that, uh, most importantly, because um, I'm, I'm into roasted chickens, roast chick roasted chickens would literally fly out of the air into your mouth or into your plate. Okay. No, this guy, he actually said this stuff. I mean, you can go look at his, wor his collected works. Um, he was crazed. Okay. So Marx, who was a socialist and came out of this tradition, looked around and said, this is crazy. Okay. The, um, basically, the classical economists had made mincemeat out of these guys, just with their own uh, under, under, underdeveloped analysis of the market economy. The classical economists were able to, to smash the utopian socialists. So Marx used one of the greatest rhetorical ploys in the history, uh, intellectual history. What he said was, Marx making noise, is what, no, that's Marx, that's what Marx said. Um, no, no, what, what, what he said was that, um, that we can't, it's unscientific for anyone to try to figure out what the future social society would look like. Um, Marx was a Hegelian, who, and he believed in uh, these um, inexorable laws of history. And according to Marx, uh, different stages of history would succeed one another um, inexorably. So just as classical, the classical slave societies of Greece and Rome were um, eventually displaced and replaced by the feudal system, and the feudal system was uh, replaced by commercial capitalism and then eventually industrial capitalism, okay, so too would industrial capitalism be eventually replaced by socialism. And he sort of made a distinction between socialism and communism, which isn't necessary to our discussion here, but eventually then we would have full communism, and history would come to an end. Okay, So he knew that. So anyone who would try to dis discuss any of this was simply being unscientific, because it was going to happen whether we talked about it or not. There was no way to slow it down. There was no way to speed it up, though. They talked about, you know, marginally changing the speeds at which, at, at which the, the one stage could displace another. But basically, just you had to, if you were a scientist, if you were scientific, you had to accept these laws of history and um, that they would bring about the final uh, socialist uh, state, okay? And so Marx, really, his, his book was called Capitalism, or Capital, right? Das Kapital. You know, capital. He, he was, so his whole analysis was of the deficiencies of capitalism. He never really spoke about socialism at all. Okay, so, so, so the, the best known socialist of, of all time never discussed socialism to, to any, any degree. Okay, his analysis was, was focused on, um, capitalism. And that was, because he didn't want anyone talking about what socialism would look like. Uh, he himself was an economist, and he probably had an idea that, that, that uh, and he did critique um, uh, uh, classical, the classical economists, so he used their system. So he, he, he just didn't want it being discussed. Okay. So uh, that, that was the um, Marxian ploy. Uh, now, the state of the debate Okay, as it stood before Mises wrote, was basically one of who would take out the garbage. Okay, that's what everybody was debating at, over. Who would do the dirty, uh, dangerous, unhealthy jobs in society if everybody got paid according to their needs? Okay, um, if there was no dis distinction between uh, wages and salaries for different for different uh, occupations and professions and so on, who would get up early in the morning and take out the stinky garbage? Okay. Um, rather than trying to get another job. So that was the, 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 the um, incentive argument that the classical economists used. The socialists then, uh, the utopian socialists, responded that, well, um, that, that's not going to be a problem because under our systems, the systems are going to be so just and so good and so beautiful, um, whichever system you're talking about, uh, that we're going to, to uh, formulate a new economic man. So um, everyone's going to, to, to do the jobs 
that would best benefit society. Okay, it wasn't explained how they would know, even if they had the desire to, to, to follow this, how they would know what jobs would best benefit society. And um, Marx himself said that, that you know, communism pretty much would solve the problem of scarcity in some sense, and that uh, you know, people would you know, be a novelist in the morning, write a novel in the morning, and, and you know, in the afternoon maybe they would you know, flip hamburgers if, if they so desired, um, or they could ride lions at, you know, at night <laughs> and so on. Um, and I think it was, I'm just reading this today, it may have been Trotsky, Leon Trotsky, who was, um, when, uh, Stalin had killed with a pickaxe in Mexico City in 1940, one of my favorite events in the history of socialism. Uh, <laughs> right, through, right through the skull. But um, he said that there would be, uh, this new social society would, would generate um, Plato's and Aristotle's and, uh, you know, uh, just as they, they were peaks today among men, well, there will be many of them, and beyond them would rise even higher peaks, okay? Even, you know, and, and, and Trotsky didn't shy away from using the word Superman. He said that the, the social society would eventually generate, su- you know, pretty much all supermen and women, okay? Don't forget the women. Okay. Um, all right. So this was the, uh, the debate. So what was Mises' thesis, okay? Mises looked at all this and he said, wait a minute, nobody's really talking about the, the crucial, deep-seated economic questions, okay, or, or question, okay. How would anyone know what the best use of resources are in a social society? And these are the steps of his argument. This, the thesis was, and I'll, I'll, I'll raise this so people back can see, the rational allocation of resources is impossible without economic calculation. And by that, he didn't mean anything too arcane, he simply meant the calculation of costs, revenues, profits, and losses by entrepreneurs. So the allocation of resources is impossible without economic calculation using actual market prices. And the argument proceeded a few steps. Basically, he pointed out that the, 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 the key um, characteristic of socialism is that it, almost all socialist plans call for the abolition of private property in the physical means of production, at least. That means in all natural resources and capital goods, okay? Um, some, some of these schemes called for even, even consumers' goods being somehow communally um, owned. Uh, others allowed for private property and consumer goods and maybe even in small gardens and so on, small production processes. But for the most part, they would all abolish private property uh, in factories, mines, um, uh, any type of machinery, um, and so on. Okay. So, since uh, socialism abolishes private property, capital goods, and natural resources, then the state becomes the sole owner of all the material factors of production, whether legal owner or de facto owner. Um, whether they're legal owner or not, they certainly are the de facto owner in that they, they will control all this property, okay, the state or the, the state representing the proletariat. Um, so they become the sole owner, and therefore... These things can't be exchanged. There's no more steel market. There's no more market for, for machines. There's no more market for raw materials, markets for raw materials. Um, there's, there's no more market, markets for rental of commercial and industrial properties and so on. Okay? The state owns everything. So you no longer have exchange. But without exchange, there can be no prices. Oops, sorry. So under socialism, therefore, the state cannot calculate the costs of production for the goods it produces. There are no costs of production under socialism. Even if the state allows free choice in the range of consumers' goods that it does produce, and so there are prices for consumer goods, there's still no costs of production. Okay? And the punchline is that in the absence of, of economic calculation of profit and loss, a socialist economy cannot know the most valuable use of the resources it controls and is therefore strictly impossible because economize or economy comes from economize or is associated with the word economize and economize means to always use something in using something to make sure that you're not using it for for something less valuable than you could have used it for. So if you have a stock of resources, you always want to allocate them to their most valuable uses. That defines an economy. Okay? So that was Mises' argument, and it was a devastating argument. 
And as we'll see a little bit later, the socialists tried to answer it in different ways. Okay. Mises went on to say that there were certain um, institutional preconditions. Okay. Institutions that must exist in society in order for economic calculation itself to exist. The first is that there must be private property in all stages of goods, meaning in Menger's sense of stages of goods that were further from the consumer, that is, manufacturing or producing capital goods that then had to be transformed into other capital goods and further transformed until they reached the final stage of, of the consumption goods. Okay, So it wasn't just that consumer goods had to be privately owned, but all stages of production had to be privately owned. Okay, Not only did you need private ownership, but you needed the freedom to exchange all kinds of goods and services. The state could not intervene to prevent exchange or to set rigid price controls that would not allow prices to be determined. Right? Finally, you needed a sound money, a money whose value is, is, is not manipulated by governments for, uh, for their own benefit or for the benefit of, of private interests and constituencies. Okay? There, in other words, basically, uh, in practical terms, there can't be uh, you know, uh, an inflation that distorts or destroys monetary calculation. So that socialism destroys all three of these preconditions, okay? There's not freedom to, uh, there's, uh, first of all, there's not the um, all private ownership of capital goods and, um, and, and natural resources. Secondly, um, freedom to exchange is, is irrelevant when there's one monopoly owner. And uh, to the extent that people ca- can have some of their own um, production processes, okay, simpler ones connected with their households, even their exchange is extremely restricted, if not uh, prohibited, as it was uh, under war communism. There was no exchange whatsoever permitted. And, um, and sound money, well, there really isn't any money. There might be vouchers that are given out, which will allow you to buy certain amounts of goods whose accounting prices are set by the state, but um, a certain amount of consumer goods. But that's not a money. A money is a general uh, medium of exchange that everyone is routinely in society accepts. So what does this lead to? Well, let me, let me first just set out, in very basic terms, the problem of economic calculation. Uh, please ignore my handwriting, um, but let's, let's assume that the state, now, the state has all the technological knowledge that it needs, it has all the scientists at its disposal because it's the only employer, and some water. It also has all the engineers, um, it knows how to produce technologically or technically all goods that it, it desires to produce. Okay, so there's, a, you know, we can, we can assume that, that, that there's, you know, they're, they're technologically sophisticated, and so, certainly the Soviet Union was. I mean, they, they, they sent um, a cosmonaut into space before the U.S. had a manned flight. Okay, so they, and, and they built uh, MiG fighters and so on. They built very sophisticated weaponry and so on. So they, they had access to technological knowledge. That wasn't a problem. The problem becomes the lack of prices, not the lack of tech, technological knowledge. And let's assume that they want to produce an automobile. So this is what I'm going to give you is a production function, what economists call a production function of an, for an automobile. Production function mean, meaning that uh, a certain quantity of, of, of the output of a certain good um, can be generated by a certain combination of resource inputs. So let's say they know how to produce an automobile, or we could even think of uh, a batch of 100,000 automobiles that they want to produce. And that would take the following. Okay? It would take P tons of steel, certain amount of steel. They know that. Um, certain hour, number of hours of machine time, uh, a certain amount of engineering labor, a certain amount of unskilled labor, you need space, you need factory space, it would take a certain amount of factory space, certain number of, of kilowatt hours of, of, of electricity, and some managerial labor. So combining all of those things would give you one automobile, or if you want to take the unit as a million, one million automobiles, or whatever it is. Um, well, let's say 100,000 automobiles. So should it, in fact, do that? Okay. Well, the question then becomes... It has to compare the value of all of those different assets, of all of those different goods, which can be used in a multitude of other production processes. You can be producing bicycles, construction. You can be producing more steel for the future. Um, you can be producing 
more farm implements. You could be increasing um, the amount of, um, of, 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 let's say, uh, a gasoline and so on, okay? Uh, or or, or uh, to, to complement the automobiles that are already on, on the road. Okay, so you could produce many different things with all these different types of labor, okay? How do you know that this combination and this combination only is the most valuable? Can they add up their cost of production? Even if there's a price in rubles, let's say, of, of, of the final good automobiles, let's say the, the workers are actually paid in rubles, which they were, and, and then they could spend these rubles freely on this market um, that was controlled by the state. Um, would the state be able to know whether there are profits or losses, whether it should actually allocate the resources in this manner? Of course not. Because how can you add tons of steel with hours of machine time, with hours of engineering labor, with um, square feet of, of factory space? You can't add apples and oranges. So they would not know their cost of production. They would not know if this is the best use of these resources, if, in fact, they were economizing on their scarce resources. Okay, So strictly, there cannot be a socialist economy. I mean, they can do this, and the Soviet Union did do things, but it would be very chaotic, as we'll see, as I'll show you. Now, let's just take um, the following. Even a simple decision on, let's, let's say I could, I could use, um, there are many different ways to produce automobiles, right? I mean, they were hand-produced up until the mass production started in 1910. Okay? So from the 1890s onward, they were, they, were, they were produced by hand by a few craftsmen who produced all the parts in a small bicycle shop or blacksmith shop. Okay, so should you hand produce them and have very little capital? Okay, so should we um, add more hours, or, or should we, 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 or going all the way to the the Japanese model, you can produce them with a lot of capital and very little labor. You can change the production. Function. You can have robots running the whole factory, controlled by computers, and one guy in the morning just pushing a few buttons to start the factory, the process going. Should you do it that way? You want to do it the way that is cheapest given the same quality of, of, of the output, okay? So they can't even make a decision of whether or not they should um, maybe uh, decrease labor and send more labor to produce agricultural goods and add some more machine time, okay? Even that there, they don't know which, way, which one will lower costs. So they can't even make those types of decisions. Okay? Should they make the bumper out of titanium? Which would uh, cut down on, on a number of, um, of, of uh, or the amount of damage in a given accident, or should they make it out of steel, or should they make it out of fiberglass as it's made out of today? Bumpers, okay? They can't calculate. They wouldn't know what is economical. Now let's look at the auto industry, okay? Well, all right. So let's assume that um, the, the the price of uh, the expected price of a of an automobile is um, I don't know why I wrote two different things here, two different lectures. Let's say the expected price of an automobile is twenty eight thousand dollars. Okay, um, so in order to to um, to calculate, you have to have an, anticipate the price. Okay, this is a new model that you're going to be producing. It's going to come on the market three years from now. Let's say, so you expect the price to be twenty eight thousand dollars. Three years from now, the price is twenty five thousand dollars. The entrepreneur has made a mistake. Okay, we're not saying that capitalism, that entrepreneurs under capitalism do not make mistakes. They certainly can make mistakes, but they know that they've made a mistake. What they've done then was to use twenty-eight thousand uh, uh, dollars. I'm sorry, twenty. Yeah, it cost twenty-eight thousand dollars. Did I say? No, no. Okay, I said no. No, all right, no. Let's say it, it was twenty-eight thousand dollars the price, and the cost was twenty-five. Okay, there they were very successful. They benefited the consumers. They took twenty-five thousand dollars worth of resources and used them in a way that was valued by consumers at $28,000. They reaped $3,000 in profits, and the consumers got something more valuable. Okay, Because if, if, if other entrepreneurs had purchased those, those um, resources for $25,000, they would have basically produced goods worth about $25,000 out of them. So they outbid them, and they produced goods that were worth $28,000. On the other hand, what if the um, cost of production is $32,000? Then they realize they've made a mistake. They've wasted scarce resources. Those resources could have been better used elsewhere because there are other entrepreneurs willing to pay thirty-two thousand when they purchased the labor and rented the factory space and so on. Okay, uh, but they they bid up the thirty-two thousand. They got the resources, but they produced automobiles that were worth only twenty-eight thousand. The market has a natural selective process, as Mises says, to weed out entrepreneurs that make mistakes. Okay, and it's not sending them to Siberia or shooting them, as we'll see. That's that's one of the substitutes for the price system. 
Um, so in any case, uh, there's always uncertainty. So we're not saying that there's no uncertainty under capitalism. Capitalism and socialism both operate under uncertainty. The point is, though, that there is a guide for the entrepreneur. He's able to calculate. He's able to use his forecasting abilities okay, and, and rely on those abilities because he, he, ha- he has an idea of what the price will be and he can therefore determine, given those prices, what it's worth um, in terms of resources to produce those goods. Okay? Socialists are completely in the dark on all of this. Okay? Let me give you a, an example, um, which, which I, I like to give. My, my fr- my, I have a friend who I grew up with um, who married um, a real-life cowboy, actually. Somebody actually has a cattle ranch um, out in Montana. And so she moved out there, and you know, I still keep in touch with her, but uh, this was maybe, maybe 10, 12 years ago. She called me up, and she said, um, she says, Joey, I got a new house. She calls me Joey. Very few people I allow to call me Joey. And they all live in New Jersey. So, um, so don't, don't, don't ever try it. Anyway, um, so she, she said, I, well, you have a new house. I said, well, I thought you had a big farmhouse. Was, the ranch does pretty well. She says, yeah, yeah, I do. She says, but this is a bigger one. You know, it's got six bedrooms, whatever it was. And um, so she says, um, I said, well, what did you do with the other one? Knock it down? She says, no, we, we just had it moved, hauled away, and we hauled in a new one. I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, our house was built in um, uh, N- Nebraska. You know, she lives in Montana. I said, what do you mean it was built in Nebraska? So what, what they did was to have these huge factories that build houses out in this part of the country in, mo- in, p- in modular pieces and then ship them via truck to the, the site and then put them together. So that's a more a capital-intensive way to build houses, right? Instead of having all these workers come to the site, right, and have them build the house, as we do in the nor- Northeast, there they have them built in a capital-intensive manner, using a lot of, 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 of factory space and, and machinery, in, in the, and, and then using a lot of, of, of trucks and so on to have them hauled. Okay, so they're built in one place, then they're shipped. I don't know how far Nebraska is from Montana. I have, you know, I, I, I don't know that part of the, of the country, the geography of the country um, there, but, you know, let's say a 1,000 miles, whatever the heck it is. Uh, why do they do that? Because there's like 12 people that live in Montana. It's a huge state. So there's better use. Labor is so scarce that its price is very high. Those people have greater value, the labor force, on cattle ranches, um, working oil wells, because there is some oil. She actually has oil on her property, and uh, farming various kinds of grains. Okay, So it's less expensive to actually have a house built a thousand miles away and shipped. Now, could a, could, a, could a Soviet planner ever figure that out? Without prices? Of course not. How could you ever, ever, it's so counterintuitive. How would you, how would you be able to arrive at that conclusion? That, yeah, we should buy, build the houses in, you know, Kamchatka and ship them back to, um, Irkutsk or wherever, um, wherever it is. Kazakhstan, I don't know. All right. <laughs> I'm not sure. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm really grateful for her giving me this, um, this example, I mean, she didn't realize she was giving me the example, but I tell her I use her in, in, in one of these lectures. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, now, did Mises say, as he sometimes charged th- uh, 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 as saying, that no economy could ever rationally allocate resources? No, he didn't. What he said was that a highly complex industrial economy with a lot of long processes of production, which use a lot of capital, so it's very intricate, um, those economies, the industrial economy basically, could not calculate. Could a small household economy, a small tribe, uh, you know, a Native American Indian tribe, um, uh, or, or Robinson Crusoe shipwrecked on his island, could they rationally allocate resources without economic calculation? Because they're not going to have prices, they're not going to have exchange. In fact, Mises said, yes, of course they can, okay? Where the processes are short and simple, and there's only a few... Um, capital goods or producer goods, you can absolutely um, rationally allocate resources. But that's not, that's not our economy. So just to give you a quick example, and also to shed further light on the problem of socialism, um, here's what we call direct valuation. There's two ways to rationally allocate resources. Direct valuation and economic calculation. Direct valuation means that you, val- you can value with these short processes and very simple um, goods that you're producing. You can value the the producer goods directly, 
So you can know the opportunity cost. You can know if you're wasting resources, okay? To some extent, you do that in your own household when you're allocating consumer goods that you've already purchased, okay? You know whether or not you should use your swimming pool for swimming or putting garbage in, okay? Because you know the opportunity cost. If I put garbage in it, if I just store my garbage there for a while, I can't swim in it, okay? And swimming has a higher utility to me than storing garbage there instead of storing it in garbage cans in my garage, okay? I mean, so you, you can make those kinds of decisions. Mises has never denied any of that. So here's Crusoe. Let's say he has 12 hours to work, okay? Um, to me, that would seem like he's a workaholic, but let's say he's going to allocate these in three-hour units, okay? I'd be, I'd be lying on the beach for most of the day. That's my main consumer good, okay? But leisure is a consumer good, by the way, fortunately. Okay, so let's say for three hours he'll fish during this day. This is, this is his value scale. Values fish, two fish the most that will, three hours will yield. Uh, then, um, you know, he wants to vary his diet, so he's going to have, pick wild mushrooms um, for three hours and then climb trees and knock down eight coconuts so he can have something to drink and, and uh, dessert. Uh, he'll have a sack of berries. That, that, that eats up his 12 uh, hours, okay? Now let's assume he wants to decide, uh, he wants to know, he found some other opportunities on the island. He found, finds that there's rabbit and that he likes rabbit stew, okay? So, should I allocate some hours to producing a rabbit? Or, instead of climbing those trees, should I um, spend six hours making an axe, okay? Which will then increase my productivity in coconuts, because I can, I can cut the tree down and the coconuts, I'll have more coconuts in, in the same amount of time. Okay, can he determine the cost? Sure, it's easy, right? All he has to say to himself is, if it takes three hours to catch the rabbit, then his, um, to hunt, to hunt and, and kill the rabbit, um, then his decision is the following. What's the lowest ranked use of the three hours? What's the more, more well, it's, it's one sack of berries. So the cost of the rabbit, okay, is what? The foregone utility from one sack of berries. So he can, he can allocate it. So if the rabbit, if he values the rabbit more than that, then he will forego the berries, okay? And, 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 and uh, hunt, hunt the rabbit, okay? On the other hand, if not, then he'll say, the rabbit is too costly. I'll have to give up too much to get the rabbit. On the other hand, if he wants to build the axe, uh, it'll take some six hours, then he'll have to give up eight coconuts and one sack of berries, okay? So he'll say to himself, or he'll compare in his mind, whether the utility of the extra coconuts in the future from making that axe is worth giving up today eight coconuts plus one sack of berries. That's the cost of the axe. So he knows the cost, all right? So to make a long story short, I took that little diversion um, because, or that little digression, because Mises has been accused of saying that, that uh, you know, every economy must be able to calculate in order to rationally allocate resources, that is to economically re- allocate resources to their highest um, uses, highest valued uses, all right? So Mises, Mises did not say that. He said, under certain institutional conditions, you, you absolutely need economic calculation. Okay. All right, so we can um, conclude that, that, that socialist eco- uh, the socialist economy is literally impossible because it cannot calculate the opportunity cost of producing of any particular process of production, as I've shown you with, with the automobile, okay? Um, not only just producing more or less automobiles, but also determining what technology to use, as I've shown you. Okay, should we use more capital-intensive technology, or should we use more labor and less, less machinery? Okay, they can't do that either. Um, in fact, socialist planning is an oxymoron. It's an inconsistent use of words. Um, as Mises called it, it's planned chaos, Okay. Now, now I'll talk a little bit about the Soviet economy. Um, in the 1980s, there was famine in, in, in the Soviet Union, um, and yet there were tractors that were rusting in the fields. Okay, so there were tractors. There were fields of unharvested grain. There were silos that could have held that grain after it was harvested, but they were empty. Okay. Um, so you had the grain, you had the tractors, you had the silos, but you didn't have enough laborers and you didn't have enough gasoline. Okay, because the laborers were all producing steel. And they were using the gasoline and, uh, or the energy products to produce the steel. Uh, and and that, that greater steel was then used to produce more tractors, of course, okay, which then rusted in the fields. Okay. So 
you had famine in the midst, in a country that's one of the, the most fertile countries in Europe, okay, if you include the Ukraine, okay, or in the world, okay? So be, because they couldn't calculate, not because they didn't know how to produce grain or tractors or, or steel or anything else, but because they couldn't calculate. Um, in fact, we used, uh, the Soviets used, in place of the price system, well, in fact, I think I have something here, was something that we call gross output planning. Let me just write that out for you. And the Central Planning Board of the Soviet Union was known as Ghost Plan. So basically what Ghost Plan would do is to come out with a general um, plan for the next five years, or whatever it was, and then in there, there would be certain quantities of goods that they planned to produce. And then those quantities would be sent down to the ministers of the various industries, and they would break it up among the various plants and firms um, in, 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 in those industries, Okay. And basically, the um, gross output planning involved these quantitative targets for, um, for output. But it was extremely difficult to specify the quality that you wanted. Okay? So, for example, now, by the way, the incentive system was set up so that managers that met their targets, okay, so each, eventually when it was all broken down, the plan, it, 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 each plant or each, each firm and, and, and uh, was given a target. The manager met, met the target, he would get bonuses. Okay, um, He would get to spend two or three weeks vacation at a dasha on the a Black Sea and, and so on. He would get monetary bonuses. On the other hand, if he missed the target and if he missed it consistently, then he would get a quick trip to Siberia. Okay, So it was a carrot and a stick kind of thing. Um, so of course, what is the incentive for the manager? He, he'll, he, he'll always lie. He'll always underestimate how much he can produce. Because if he does that, it's easy to exceed his target and, get, and avoid going to Siberia and get the, the, the bonuses. On the other hand, they know he's going to lie. Ghost Plan knows all the managers are going to lie. So what do they do? They take his estimate and, of course, they add you know, 20% to it. Now, he knows that they're going to do that. <laughs> so he underestimates it even more. No, I mean, it's just a system of mutual deceit or deception. Okay? All right. Now, um, what is the outcome of this uh, gross output planning? What was the outcome of the gross output planning? Well, you had situations where, where Western observers and economists would, would point out that there were all these completed buildings in the Soviet Union, commercial buildings, residencies, but people couldn't occupy them because they had no roofs, okay, or no roofs. And the reason why they had no roofs was, was because there was a lack of small building nails, okay? And why was there a lack of small building nails? Because they would specify the target in terms of total tons of nails, Okay, so what you had then was a lot of huge nails being produced um, that were good for some things, but not good for other things. So you didn't have enough, there was an underproduction of the smaller nails, okay, because it was easier to meet your target by producing fewer, very large, heavy nails. Okay, so um, also, you know, uh, as Russian women became more aware of Western fashions and they became more style conscious, um, they began to, there were complaints that leaked out to the West that, you know, women were walking around in these, you know, huge moo dresses. There were, there were hardly any small sizes, okay? All sizes were huge because people were making huge dresses because their targets were specified in terms of yards of, 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 of material used in, in producing dresses, okay? A lot of large size shoes, few small size shoes because it costs more per, per shoe when you're making smaller shoes to, um, to, to, to meet your target. Okay, so um, there, there's a famous um, cartoon, which I can't find now online, but I, I drew it. <laughs> um, basically, it looks something like this. Okay, okay. There's the uh, minister of the um, industry here. He's got that, one of those weird Russian fur hats on. Okay. <laughs> there's the manager. He's pointing. He's saying, well, comrade... We've met our target for the year. And that's a huge train, okay? Uh, and that's one screw, okay? Okay, well, you get the idea. That's it tended to promote that, that sort of um, lack of quality, okay, or lack of, 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 of diversity of different types and qualities of things, 
of things. Okay? Okay. Okay, now, some people have argued that Mises' is impossibility thesis, his thesis that socialism was impossible because it could not calculate economically, um, was undermined by the fact that, look, the Soviet Union lasted from 1917 till 1990 or 1989. You know, when, did, when did it actually... Was it 1990? Whatever. Okay. So over, over 70 years. It lasts for over 70 years. Okay. But Mises pointed out in his very first article that there is no true socialism in, 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 in the world, certainly in the 1920s, and, and even later on. In fact, he said that the Soviet Union was in, posi- in the position of the post, the post office in, in, in a capitalist country. The post office is incredibly inefficient, but it can still calculate because it does what? It uses the prices of the market around it. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a lump, it's, cal- it's chaotic in some sense. It's calculational chaos. They don't produce the right things, they're, they're, they're very inefficient and so on, but there's still uh, some sort of a limit on how inefficient they can be. And so what Mises pointed out was that this is true of the Soviet Union. They're using world prices. And in fact, they did use world prices. Okay. Uh, in fact, if you want to even push it further um, in the Soviet Union, you can think of it as one huge monopoly or cartel in a, in a world economy because they did export electricity, coal, gold, um, wheat, and so on to the other countries. And they, they could calculate using those prices. Of course, since their specific conditions do not match those of other countries, the prices were not the correct prices, but at least there were pri- prices that they, could, that they could use in some rough and ready fashion. Okay, So they, they use these, these world market prices, number one. Number two, um, the managers themselves would, um, would, be, would go through brokers. There would be these illegal brokers who were sort of... In order, in order to meet the targets and so on, all the plants use them. That is, if they had extra wood, they would trade the wood for um, more screws from another factory that had, had excess screws. So th- there were market prices in some sense, uh, black market prices. Uh, it was called, um, uh, I forget the name. Well, th- those, I, don't, I forget the name of the brokers that, that, that engaged in this. Also, there were, there were, there were bribes, okay? They would, they would bribe certain um, other factories and so on to, to, to get certain goods that they had in short supply. And that was called BLAT, B-L-A-T, the system of bribes. The system of bribes were black market price. There were prices. Okay? And of course, um, when they started opening up more in the 1980s, uh, you, know, you had Beatles records, jeans, and so on. You had a huge black market in, in, in Western goods there, okay? which gave you prices. Okay. Um, the only time there was really true so, um, socialist central planning was where there was no exchange whatsoever, I alluded to this before, was from 1917 to 1921, approximately, which was called war communism. Okay? They went to a system of full communism. Now, later on, they claim, it just was called communism then. Later on, um, Trotsky tried to, to, sort of, to, to, to sort of whitewash the whole thing. He said, well, you know, we were forced into that extreme situation by the fact that uh, we were fighting the white Russian troops and um, the Western uh, powers had troops in Russia that you know, were making war on us and so on. And so uh, we were under a state of siege, so we had to go to this extreme sort of economy. But that wasn't true. That's what they planned all along. And they found that they abolished all, every price, every type of exchange. Okay? And basically then, the whole economy began to collapse. They be- it, began- it became a vampire economy. It began to consume itself. Okay? Um, or self-cannibalizing economy. Um, at the end, people were leaving the cities because they, all the food was gone, and they had burned up all the furniture to keep warm, and they were beginning to burn parts of the houses. So they all went out into the countryside, and they began just, they were just roving bands now, just um, foraging for food, stealing food from, the, from the, what was left to the farmers, and so on. So basically, that's what, I mean, you can have a social society. It's basically just a, a, a roving bands of gangs. Okay, small households that that you, you don't need ca- calculation in. I mean, that, that's what socialism, true socialism, ultimately uh, um, resolves itself into. Okay, uh, or Pol Pot's Cambodia. Okay, he moved everybody where out of the cities. Okay, put everybody to work on the land, killed two million people maybe because he couldn't feed them, um, and so you know that was the way he got rid of prices. Okay, but at, what me again? 
What Mises was saying was that to have a civilization, to have um, rational production and allocation of scarce resources, you need economic calculation. We're not saying that people can't subsist at some level okay, and have some sort of an economy, okay, maybe a household economy or a, a small bar- groups of people bartering, but you couldn't run an industrial economy without economic calculation, which means without prices and markets, which means in turn without private property and free exchange. Okay. Okay, let me just say a few words about how um, the socialists tried to respond to all of this, to, to Mises. Actually, before I do that, I just want to show you something. Hopefully, you can see it. Um, okay. What Mises stressed, and I'll, I'll put this up a little higher in a moment, was that everyone, all consumers, entrepreneurs, resource owners, um, producers, um, everyone who was participated in the market economy was involved in the process of determining the price structure. He called this the appraisement process. All of us, okay, acting independently of one another on our own volition are needed to interact in markets to determine the cost of production, to impute or to appraise the prices of, of goods. The entrepreneur is in the center, but the entrepreneur needs to interact with the resource owners, with the laborers, or with the consumers. So you have the entrepreneurs, and here's what they do. Um, they experience present prices. They look around, they see what present prices are. Okay. They then use these present prices, not to plan production, but as the basis for understanding the future, meaning the, as the basis for making projections of what prices will be in the future. Okay. So if they notice that the price of gasoline is, is going up and people are turning away from SUVs, and if they make the forecast that gasoline prices are going to stay high because, let's say, the U.S. is going to continue to make war in the Middle East okay, and, and, and strangle the, the flow of oil, well, then, then they will begin to um, build smaller cars, expecting that the price of smaller cars will be high and the prices of, uh, and demands and prices of, 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 of the uh, larger cars and SUVs and so on will be low, Okay. Um, so they'll do that. Now they'll bid for resources. Okay, they'll they'll they'll, they'll bid against one another. Producers of all these different t- types of goods. Think of all the goods, consumer goods that you can purchase today in the U.S. The entrepreneurs producing them are bidding against one another for the non-specific resources, for resources that can be used like steel or electricity or labor in any of many many production processes. In bidding against one another, they're bidding with an eye to what the future prices will be. That, those are their forecasts. So they're never going to pay more than they expect to be compensated for in the future when they sell those goods. So this is what we call the social appraisement process. Okay? So it starts with the entrepreneurs looking at today's prices, forecasting through their abilities to forecast the future and to, and to know what consumer demands will be and how technology will change, forecasting future prices, and then with those forecasts in mind, going in and buying and bidding on the factors of production. So at every moment in time now, right now as we speak, there's a price for steel, there's a price for electricity, uh, there's not only prices for consumer goods, but there's prices for any conceivable f- type of, of, of input that you can think of. Titanium, uh, you know, what, uh, computer chips. So if you want to produce something, if you have a production plan, you can always find what? You can always determine the cost of production. Everybody can determine the cost of production. And if those costs exceed what you expect to receive for the good when it's produced, at that point you'll say, I'm not going to produce this because I'll lose money. So you're acting selfishly, but, or self-interestedly, uh, but the point is you're benefiting consumers because you're not using the goods to produce things that consumers value less. You're letting other entrepreneurs who have bid the higher prices have those resources and produce something that has more value to consumers. Okay, So that's why... Uh, entrepreneur, or that's how entrepreneurs um, re- um, respond to consumer demand. Okay, there's consumer sovereignty, right. in that sense. Consumers are king. Okay. Um, all right. Now, what was the? Uh, you don't have that process because you only have. You can't have this process in the um, socialist economy because you only have one will acting. You don't have people with independent wills interacting with one another, forming prices and so on. Okay. So the real problem of socialism. 
The ultimate problem is one of property and the fact that one, there's one owner of all the productive property in the economy, even if it's a group of individuals, even if it's a large group of individuals, they're acting collectively, so there can be no exchange. So there's only, as Mises says somewhere, the problem of socialism is that there is one will acting. Okay? And one will can't create a price system. Okay? You can't trade with yourself. Right? There has to be a social appraisement process, which means there has to be a market. Okay. So what were the, some of the um, responses that um, so I got them here that were made to, to Mises' argument? Well, I, I can't put it up because I don't I printed it out, but I did not um, include it. I didn't take it out of the uh, Oh, yeah, here it is. That's why I left it in my printer. Okay. First, there were, there were very naive Marxists. Early in the 1920s, these naive Marxists responded to Mises. Okay. And um, the first response was um, incredibly naive. Okay. And uh, it was basically calculating in kind. Okay. And this was put forth by Otto Neuroth, who was um, a fanatical Marxist. He basically said, what problem? There is no calculation problem. Um, and by the way, the, the Trotsky also said this, or Lenin also said this. Basically, capitalism has developed accounting. Okay, we know how we know the four rules of arithmetic. We'll just add up the stuff that we use and compare it to 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 you know what we what, what, what we get the receipts that we get. But the point is, of course, that's adding apples and oranges. How can you add up? See, he said we don't need prices. We can account in natural units. So it's called accounting in natura, accounting in, in the natural units. So you, in other words, you're going to add tons of steel and he's going to try to add kilowatts of electricity and so on. This was stupid and Mises easily showed that it violates the laws of arithmetic. You can't add apples and oranges and get a meaningful sum. Okay? Uh, there's heterogeneous goods in the real world. They can't be added together. You can add together all the apples or all the steel. You can't add those different apples and steel together. Which is, by the way, what governments do when they give us GDP figures, okay? Which is why they're bogus. Um, okay. The second was that Marxists that were a little smarter said, you know what? Karl Marx gave us a solution. We'll calculate with labor hours. We'll figure out in labor hours how much certain capital goods, how many hours certain capital goods take to produce, how many hours certain consumer goods take to produce, and so on. But of course, you know, there's, there's three problems with that. Labor itself is heterogeneous. I mean, is Kobe Bryant, the basketball player, an hour of his time, is, it, is that equal to an hour of the time of, of the 12th guy sitting on the end of the bench? Of course not. Okay? Basketball players come in all different types of productivities. Okay? And that's true in every profession and every occupation. Labor itself is heterogeneous. An hour of a brain surgeon's time differs from the hour of uh, someone who operates uh, heavy machinery. Okay? Difference, difference in value. There's no way to add them up. They're heterogeneous. Um, secondly, um, it leaves out the fact that capital and, and um, natural resources are themselves scarce goods that have to be um, economized on. So how do, how do you determine that? Okay, You can't. Okay? Because natural resources are not produced. Um, also, thirdly, even the same hour of labor will have different productivity if it's combined with more or less um, capital goods. The, more cap the reason why American farmers are so much more productive today and can produce so much more um, wheat or, or other type of, of output per hour is uh, than compared to 200 years ago is because, in fact, they are working with much better equipment, much better technology, more, more capital, okay? so they're much more productive. They're, pro they're probably no more hard, harder working than, than a, a, a American farmers from 200 years ago, but they have more capital. So once again, two labor hours working with different types of machinery, even if they are of the same quality, will produce different outputs. And you can't, you won't be able to figure out since you have no unit for, for the cap measuring the capital, okay, what 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 the value of of of, of the labor is. Okay, then we had uh, we had the final sort of naive response, we'll just assume a stationary or a static economy. On the last day of capitalism, we'll just tell all the managers, the, for the morning of socialism, just come in tomorrow, okay, 
the first day of social, you come in tomorrow and do exactly what you do, did yesterday, okay? So they say they take over at five o'clock, so they tell everybody, okay, you can go home now, come in tomorrow, everybody do what you did yesterday, okay? We're not going to be any less efficient than the capitalists, we're just going to imitate the capitalists, okay? So, if, so that's, that's fine. Of course, that's ridiculous, okay? If in a static economy, <laughs> when nothing ever changes, well, of course there's no problem of economic calculation. You just do the same things over and over again. People can assume the same goods over and over again. But in the real world, people's values are continually, continually changing. Okay, we have fads and so on, fashions. We have people, um, we have also tech change in technology that introduces new goods, cell phones and so on. How, how would they know whether or not they should introduce a cell phone or when they should introduce cell phones, if at all? Okay? They won't know that. Okay, so, so in other words, this is no solution whatsoever. Okay, it's really just a restatement of the problem in some sense. Because you need profits and losses to direct people into producing goods which are, 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 are into, into using resources to produce goods that are most valuable in, in the economy. We can produce a lot more things, even new things, that, that we are not currently producing, but the time isn't ready yet. They're too costly to produce. We'd have to give up. For example, very recently, we had a solar test of a solar airplane, right? I think it it flew at 78 miles an hour, and it was a former Swiss Air Force pilot that piloted this jet, uh, this solar-powered jet. And um, so it's possible to produce it, but uh, it's, very, it's very costly. So maybe in the future, we'll be ready to produce it. But profits will tell, expected profits will tell entrepreneurs when it's commercially viable to produce solar-powered jets. Okay? All right, then we get to... Um, those were mainly German economists, that we, or German Marxists and socialists that responded to Mises. We have more sophisticated, two more sophisticated responses to Mises um, by neoclassically trained socialist-leaning economists, uh, mainly from Great Britain. I'll get through this very quickly. Um, one was simply to have a system of simultaneous equations in which all consumer va- which encompassed consumer values, uh, information about consumer values, technology, and available resources. Okay, and then if you solved all of these supply and demand equations simultaneously, you'll come out with the optimal quantities and prices for all these goods. Okay, now this was um, formulated this this solution before Mises even wrote by. Um, Two Italian economists, Vilfredo Pareto and his student, Enrico Baroni. And um, they pointed out, I mean, they, they said, yeah, this solution is something that we can think about, but it can never work in the real world. Though later economists claimed that they refuted Mises in advance, even though they never even knew his argument, because you know, they died before his argument. Well, actually, they didn't die, but they, they, they wrote these things before his argument uh, was, was written out. Um, and they pointed out, even with 100 goods and, and a certain amount of, of inputs, you would have over 70,000 equations. And back then, of course, there were no computers, and it would be impossible to solve that system of equations. Okay, uh, That was one um, solution. The other solution, the other response, was um, called the trial and error method, and it was developed by uh, an American economist for, 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 uh, and management expert, Fred M. Taylor, um, a Polish a Marxist economist, but neoclassically trained, Oscar Langa, and the British economist, Abel Lerner. And basically, they, they said, look, we'll just do the following. We'll put managers in place, and we'll tell all managers to accept the prices that the planning board sets on all the inputs. So the planning board is going to arbitrarily set prices, okay, um, initially. Okay, so then we're going to tell them to produce the quantity of output you're producing at the lowest possible price, okay, um, secondly, to produce up to the point where the last unit you produce is just equal to the cost of producing that unit. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to set price equal to marginal cost. Okay, so they're not going to earn any profits. There's going to be zero profits. But we're going to have the lowest cost production. And then, now how are we going to set the prices? We're going we're to set the prices as a, as, as a planning board. We're going to impose prices. They're going to be wrong at first. But whenever there's a shortage... We'll raise the price. That's the trial and error method. And if there's a surplus, we'll lower the price. Okay. So there was a lot of responses to this, to these two. Basically, um, Mises said to, for the first one, it only applies to a world of, 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 of no change. Okay. Because in the real world, 
the capital that you have and the val- people's values that you have and put into the equations are going to change over time as you have to tr- change a whole capital structure. Because right now we have all these capital goods that have to be changed. They're wearing out. We're not, we have to produce more, uh, we have to produce better capital goods. Okay. We have the ability to do that, but we're not going to do it until the other ones wear out. So we have to know which capital goods to produce, okay? And then the other means to said that's simply playing market, okay? Because the rules are just set up by the planners. There's still only one will behind this. It's just a game that's set up, okay? They are not true market prices, okay? All right, I'll stop there. Okay.